Good evening. How are you, my loves? How is life? How are you since we last spoke? Do you feel confident in everything you see around you? Confident that it is solid and real and that there is nothing else? Confident that you are not dreaming the world? and that this is not simply your mind's interpretation of it? Or are you confident, instead, that there are things within it that you can't be sure of? Confident in your lack of confidence in reality? Perhaps I've never really left that place. That place of doubting reality. My skepticism for the banal... I've always had more faith in dreams and in shadows. Last week was quite an event, wasn't it? This is what I'm talking about. What's the point in going back to pretending our stories aren't with us always? What's the point in pretending things are less fantastic and wonderful than they really are? Where's the sense? I feel strong, proud, exhilarated. And my writer friend, the one pulling the strings here, for let's just call her what she is, she feels triumphant, powerful, perhaps a little drunk with that power. But we can let that be. She's earned it, after all. Let us hope she doesn't abuse it. I don't think she will. If I know her as well as I think I do, which is almost as well as I know myself, if not even better than that, she won't. My story for you this week is a simple one. It is about a man who, just like us two, was proud, victorious, and strong. And he would learn that those wouldn't ever be enough. He was an enchanter, a sorcerer, a magician well-studied in dark magic, necromancy, and alchemy. You see, he grew up wanting so much more from life than the world would have been able to offer him naturally. This was, in part, due to the fact that he was born into poverty, and also because he wanted so very, very much. He wanted many things that you might understand or relate to. Comfort, stability, riches, love. But there were, of course, other things. Things like power, the admiration of all those around him, control over all those around him, war with those who he did not control. He wanted to be a king, that is to say, and he became one. It was a long journey studying and practicing his craft for so long that he was the best by far on the continent. 
and then he studied and practiced how to insinuate himself into the royal court somehow, and into the king and queen's good graces. Perhaps his greatest gift was his intelligence. He knew exactly how to make himself not only valuable, but indispensable. And that is how he orchestrated his ultimate betrayal, creating unrest among the people, enough so that he could rely on the help of a few soldiers and guards to not stand between him and the crown. That was one element. The other, of course, was murder. I don't think I need to tell you about the act. If you've gathered anything about me from the last 70 times I've spoken with you, you know that I don't care much for violence, and I don't like to celebrate it. What I will tell you about this enchanter's murders of the king and queen, and whoever else stood in his way, is that, while they weren't brutal, they were passionate. He did mean them with every cell in his body. Not because he was inherently bad, for that's not really true of anyone. But because, rather, he had been dreaming of a coup like this for so, so long. Dreaming of the day he could have everything those who oppressed him had. Everything he'd coveted in his entire lifetime. He savored the act of taking these things. It is worth the telling because the feeling was wonderful to him, and yet it was also fleeting. Guilt, he did not know, but he did know dissatisfaction. And it grew and grew within him the more he took. Once he took the throne and became king, he paid back anyone who had ever wronged him or denied him anything. If he met with protest from anyone, king, peasant, or even army, he executed them swiftly. He was not a good king to his people, for they loved him not one jot, but feared him desperately. And that was how he wanted it. He did not think he wanted love from anyone, for hate was all he had ever known anyway poor, cruel, hollow soul that he was. When he had the country under his boot, he wanted more and would send his armies, fueled by the power of his dark art, his strange summonings, to conquer neighboring lands, friend or foe. He expanded his empire, but this did not bring him satisfaction. Though he craved power, it did not sate him. He exacted revenge on anyone he perceived to ever have done him wrong, but this did not bring him satisfaction. Revenge did not sate him. Every now and then a rebellion would rise up against him. This was amusing, if perhaps a little irritating. However, he knew a great and powerful enchantment that could put an entire army under a hypnotic sort of spell. Their faces would go slack and wan, and their eyes would be alight with a strange green flame. The mark of his magic. Those who hated him could suddenly be easily instructed to die for him. At this realization, he easily made it so that everyone in the kingdom was nothing more than a subservient, soulless kind of follower. He had total control over everyone in his kingdom and no one cried out for change. No one cried out at all, or even spoke for that matter. No one did anything without his instruction. And so, people ceased to celebrate, love, or live their lives. They only did the king's bidding, nothing more. So they worked, or fought, or toiled. Whatever he told them, that's all. Children no longer played or sang. In fact, children soon ceased to exist after they had grown and no more came into the enchanter's world. His kingdom became empty and sparse, but for some mindless beings who were little more than corpses tending to his whims. 
and so, though he had craved dominion over people's lives, he found this did not sate him or bring him satisfaction. He imagined finally that perhaps he was not all-powerful, if he was subject to death, just like everyone else, king or pauper alike. And so, for a time, he had renewed purpose, as he sought the secret to eternal life. Every book he read, every voice of every voice of reason from his past, warned that this was impossible and unnatural, and that it was unholy to pursue such a blasphemous thing. However, so clever, so ruthless, and so powerful was he, that he found it, and he attained it. He had achieved immortality. As far as he knew, he would live forever. But this did not bring him satisfaction. Even eternity did not sate him. He began to ache for the past, where he understood how sweet it could be to crave something and to pursue it. He remembered the taste of longing in his mouth, and he found everything now was so bland and tasteless, because he did not need anything, nothing meant anything. All he had, as he grew up in squalor, was his hatred and his want. They were his constant companions, and now they had deserted him. He became what he always wanted to be, the most powerful man in his corner of the world. What more was there left to do? What more was there left to want? It was when eternity was beginning to look so very dismal and empty to him that he finally found something interesting to him. Or rather, it found him. One night he went into town for a change of pace. The streets were in a state of squalor and despair. In any other city they would have been full of hungry people, unhappy people, full of misery and anger and violence. But here, here there was only silence. A terrible, empty silence. Every now and then a listless servant with green flame in their eyes wandered by, lost and absent. But there had once been a buzzing marketplace here. Puppet shows, street musicians. Now there were only withered hulls of obedient monsters roaming. The enchanter had taken away their free wills. And now he felt he missed the thrill of opposition. Now he was surrounded by the defeated people who once thrived here, and he couldn't remember why he ever wanted any of this in the first place. Then he saw someone. Someone who caught his eye for a number of reasons. First, it was that he was moving quickly. The people of this place were all under his terrible spell and moved as if they were all asleep. This man, however, ran. He ran with keen eyes and quick feet, taking things that he needed from here and there, and none of the enchanters bewitched knew to stop him. He was also smiling, thrilled, it seemed, at the idea of being able to do as he pleased. Next, though, the enchanter noticed his beauty. Not that he was lovely in the classical sense, in the way one imagines a virtuous young man from your museum sculptures and classical paintings of gods and men are, but he was beautiful in a way that only a man like our enchanter could notice, for this man had a darkness to his eyes and to his brows, a well-practiced hardness combined with perhaps a natural cruelty. All of these details told our enchanter that the young man had once lived in luxury and nobility, where he could do no wrong. He had grown entitled and demanding, and that's when he lost everything. So the enchanter surmised he had his own dissatisfaction and longing. He must be a prince or nobleman from a defeated country, here to exact revenge, perhaps. 
The young man had a twisted smile on his wine-stained lips. His hair was once very well quaffed, but now had grown a little too long and was disheveled from a night of drink. His clothes were old, torn, stained, but were once lavish and grand. He looked like a ghost from the world that the enchanter had defeated. And so he caught the other man's eye with this decrepit beauty. Furthermore, however, his actions were a different thing, as an empty, joyless shell of a person stumbled by with an empty wheelbarrow for even though their work was done, the enchanter still hadn't relieved them of their duty. The young man growled and kicked it over. Was it out of frustration or cruelty? For a moment, the sorcerer saw an expression of joy cross the man's face. Then he saw it disappear as quickly as it came. He, too, longed for more, it seemed. He was hungry for something. Was it power and control, too? Perhaps. No matter, either way, it gave the cruel ruler of this poor kingdom a cruel idea. The young man stumbled his way towards a shabby tavern, holes in its roof, just a skeleton of the lively place it had once been. He snuck behind the bar and found himself a bottle of wine, dusty and ancient, and sat in the corner bitterly drinking it. Our enchanter came in and sat across from him. When he removed his hood to reveal his identity, the man started to move to get out of his chair and run for the door, but this impulse was soon rejected with a small gesture of the wizard's hand which slammed the door shut as if by magic. You want riches, like you once had. The man sat, dumbfounded, and didn't reply. The enchanter continued. You want everything you were ever promised before I came and took it away. Wealth, power, respect, the love of a thousand people. The man only nodded, just a little. I will give you all of those things. I will give you my entire kingdom. All you have to do is kill me. You will not be punished. You will not be blamed. Do this, and everything I have is yours. At this, the young man hardly hesitated when he took a dagger out from the side of his boot and plunged it into the enchanter's chest. He held it there for a long moment, looking the other man in the eye. But the enchanter just smiled and laughed a deep, rumbling laugh in his chest. He placed his long, elegant fingers over the other man's hand. I'm afraid it won't be that easy. He slowly pulled the dagger from his body, and his drinking companion stared in awe as the wound healed itself almost instantly before his eyes. It will likely be impossible. Quite impossible. You'll have to find some means to do it. Some means beyond mortal knowledge. The enchanter stood up and placed his hand on the young man's shoulder just as I did. He placed his hood back over his head, disguising himself. Come back here a year from now, if you're not successful, that is. We'll meet every year on this day until you have enough knowledge and power to complete the deed. He nodded a sly, respectful nod in the young man's direction and left the tavern. The king now had a purpose. He returned to his castle, thrilled that he now had to prepare against attack from someone. He had to defend himself against a vengeful young prince, or so he imagined him to be. Months and months went by, and the king never turned a corner or entered a room without carefully eyeing the place, readying himself for an attack of some kind. 
when none came for almost a year. The cruel wizard smiled to himself, for he could perfectly picture the young man studying dutifully, traveling the world, seeking to know the secrets that hardship and want had driven the enchanter to study in the first place. So the young man wasn't quite so brash and impulsive as he seemed. And as their meeting date at the tavern approached, the enchanter began to even grow excited, eager to discuss these secrets, this powerful magic with a kindred spirit. He was, though he would never admit it, eager for the company. And the day came. The enchanter walked the streets of his kingdom, even emptier than usual somehow, and found the old tavern. No one was there. He waited for hours, and he was shocked to realize he was heartbroken. He had been looking forward to this day for so long. Why wasn't the other man here? Where was his apprentice in ruthlessness and darkness? Eventually he started back for his castle, up winding steps and down long corridors of cobblestone walls. He found the front gates, and there was the young man, standing just outside, leaning against the wall. You weren't there, the enchanter said bitterly. The young man shrugged. You said we'd meet every year on this day until I had enough knowledge and power to defeat you, so I didn't meet you. The enchanter narrowed his eyes. You don't mean to suggest that you have that knowledge and power, then? The young man smiled, saying only, Perhaps. But you haven't killed me yet. Why? The young man arched a brow. Isn't it obvious? I think I should die from loneliness and boredom if you were gone. The enchanter raised his hand and snapped his fingers. His patience growing thin. The sky darkened and a cold wind blew through the streets of his kingdom. He kept his hand raised high, poised to strike again. You forget our bargain. Fight me. The young man offered a wide smile. I made no bargain. You did. And I've decided to change the terms. He turned his head to the side and a flash of green flame passed over his eyes. Soon enough, the two men were surrounded by a large crowd of wretched, sleepwalking citizens, their eyes reflecting that same green flame in them. Then the young man raised his hand and snapped his fingers as well. Suddenly, all of the people who had spent so many long years just mindlessly serving a ruthless, magical king lost that green flame in their eyes, and their eyes were once again their own. They looked around, confused and their eyes landed with fury and hatred on the cruel king who had kept them enchanted for so many years. But if it's a fight you want, very well, the young man said with a hint of annoyance to his voice. He reached his hands in front of him, and swiftly his own shadow stood up and passed through him, rapidly charging at the enchanter who was knocked to the ground on his back. The townspeople cheered and bowed to the seemingly young man who had defeated their tyrant, though he seemed to stand tall in his victory, and seemed all the more wise and a little more heartless than before. Not so young any more now, but ageless. The enchanter bared his teeth and hissed, rising up to his knees to try to stand, about to protest. But the other man kept speaking. There it is. 
There is the thing that made you alive before. And you haven't been alive for some time. He laughed gently. <laughs> now, I know I haven't killed you. But I have the power to do it. So I'll take your kingdom and your crown anyway, I think. Young man. He walked over to the enchanter and placed a hand on his cheek. You have eternity, remember? He then leaned over and whispered in his ear, You can take it all back from me. Your crown, your kingdom, all of it. He stood up and turned away from the enchanter. Before he left, he said one last thing. It will likely be impossible. Quite impossible. He smiled that strange, cruel smile that adored mischief and magic, and then entered his castle, a crowd of cheering, grateful citizens following him happily. And the enchanter, sitting in his defeat, also couldn't help but smile. Sometimes defeat can make us feel alive. Give us purpose. Remind us of our goals and of what we truly value in life. Sometimes... Sometimes we tell stories about people we remember from the past, or characters we've dreamed up in another life. But those stories are really about someone who is trying to write a story and is having a good deal of trouble keeping on task, or keeping me on task. Perhaps it's because I've set up this mirror right across from my microphone, and... And she's here with me. And she's here with me. And we're both trying to get accustomed to the idea of power. Because we have it. Right? Right. Good night, my friend. Good night, my friend. Hello everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to episode 71 of On a Dark Cold Night. This is Kristen, your writer, producer, podcaster, and entire creative team, basically, and cast and characters. I suppose it's all over the place now, but here we are, and here I am. A few quick shout-outs. First off, thanks to Arbob, who commented on my website under episode 69, asking, What drives you to write such stories? It amazes me. Thanks for the comment, Arbob. Um, to answer your question, I'm not sure, uh, but it starts with an image or an idea usually, and uh, I commit to it and force myself to write a story about it. For example, this week I wanted to know what would happen if a villain really did get everything they wanted. What would their world look like? My first episode came from me imagining a ghost haunting the bottom of the sea and then needing to answer, why would they be there? Why would they want to be there? I suppose I also ask myself questions based around images that I find beautiful or intriguing, or sometimes um, familiar stories that I want to put my own spin on, like in Somnambulance and Midnight. It's very hard to put my finger on, but um, I do talk a little bit about my inspiration and my process in a couple of interviews you can find online. Uh, you can find them at audiodramarama.com or podcreatures.ca. 
Anyway, thank you so much for commenting. I'm so glad you're enjoying my stories. Next, I'd like to thank everyone who purchased an On a Dark Cold Night t-shirt or hoodie. Special shout out going out to Scott M. and Bradley R. who added donations to their purchases. Thanks so much for that. It really means the world. And if you're interested in purchasing a shirt, you can check them out at bonfire.com slash on dash a dash dark dash cold dash night. If you'd like to help the show, the easiest way to do that is to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or on our Facebook page. That would be so awesome, and you may hear your words read out on air. You can also follow me on Twitter at A Dark Cold Night, Instagram at Dark Cold Night Podcast, or on my Facebook page or YouTube channel. If you'd like to support financially, uh, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash darkcoldnight, where for any amount pledged monthly, you can access my soundtrack. If you don't want that access and only want to donate once, you can buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. Finally, you can also help by listening to the show on the free Radio Public app, where every listen actually works towards paying me for my effort. It's a great app, and like I said, free for you and good for me, so uh, that would be awesome if you gave us a listen there. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. I hope you're doing well and enjoying your summers. Sweet dreams, friends. <laughs>